U.S. or global and say literacy, and they, they have various tests. And a, a couple of interesting things. First of all, the lower half, upper half, well, mid, the median is eighth grade, which means that at least half of the country is not comprehending things adequately at, at, above that rate, which means that, you know, and, and people are told to, to write to a seventh grade, eighth grade level. And, and that's to say, come from here down to there. And I'm not sure that that's even far enough in order, based on what, what you know, his strategy has been. Um, the second thing was, is that the response to it was a lot of articles about his cognitive decline, about he's 70 years old, about blah, blah, blah. And yet there was only one that I found that said, no, 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 no. <laughs> if you look at his linguistic use five years ago, 10 years ago, he's using very complex sentence structure and very complicated words. And it has gradually changed as he's adapted his messaging to reach the people that he wants. And I thought that was very interesting. <laughs> so anyway, that was it. Um, it's super interesting, Scott. And did you see, I put a link in the chat yesterday to my brain on Scott Adams on Trump. Yes. Okay. Yes, I, I had seen him before the linguistic kill shots and the persuasion and, and all of that. Um, so yeah, I found that that's been in there kind of poking around. And, and my, my hypothesis has been, don't write this off as the ramblings of an idiot. Exactly. And, and I, so I, I did a, a series of videos about Trump uh, kind of a, a, a year ago, I guess, in the middle of the campaign. Yeah, 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 yeah. The six and, series, the, the short ones. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And and part of part of what I was trying to say is that this is actually. I think that Trump's persona is very intentional. Uh, like he's a better caricature of the greedy billionaire than William Thurston Howell the third, or Scrooge McDuck, or <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. But to not um, write it off as being not. He doesn't know what he's doing. Not I think intentional. He does, I think he doesn't know what he's doing, and that's scary. And then second small story, and then we can start in on the call. Um, there's a really interesting history about Dr. Seuss, uh, and apparently he was challenged to write an extremely simple language um, in order to do a new kind of reading training, which was, I think, whole, yeah. word, whole word training. Mm -hmm. And so the challenge to Dr. Seuss was to write children's books with no more than 250 word vocabularies, hence the cat in the cat hat. hat. Yeah. And, and so on and so forth. And, and so pop on pop. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so his constraints were actually to back a terrible theory about learning to read because whole word learning like screwed up a lot of people's ability to actually read properly. Um, anyway, uh, hmm. uh, let me let me change rooms for a second. Uh, we are, uh, I'm listening, but uh, I have to switch rooms. But then let's start in on our call. Anybody else want to just uh, pick up and check in? Well, I'm happy to say hello, everyone. How are you doing? Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, I'm partly there because today is a slow, <laughs> complex morning. But yes, I do think this is very important. We want to learn from what we did. So I will definitely try to be present. I'm back. I'm going to put on a nice background. Um, and I'm in a really interesting place because today might be the day that Biden uh, gets called for, uh, uh, you know, that, that the networks at least call the election for Biden, which is pretty cool. Today yeah. was definitely a much better day to wake up and hear the news. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, I, I went to sleep on Tuesday and the last thing I saw was the Washington Post's website where it looked like Trump had a clear shot at becoming president. And I was like, okay, that's not very good. And I'm, I haven't shaved since the weekend. I, just, <laughs> I decided I wasn't gonna shave until uh, Biden, until Trump basically concedes. And I, I'm, I mean, <laughs> That could yeah, be January. <laughs> it's true. I could be like the old, the old white guy with the beard. I think my criteria is gonna be until Biden is accepted as president, which could happen today, tomorrow. 
the whole idea of when Trump like lets his knobby fingers off the presidency is a whole different matter and, and a matter of considerable fascination at this moment because everybody's trying to figure out how to discourage him from holding on. Considering what he did with the birther movement, I really don't see that happening. <laughs> I yeah. think it's more how we get to talk to our friends around us that we've kind of been alienated from. You know, if we could somehow allow things to sink back into the way it used to be. Yeah, and Ken, so sorry about Kanye. Um, <laughs> part, part, <laughs> partly I'm fascinated I'm fascinated that how Trump leaves the stage has a bit to do, maybe a lot to do with his role over the next decade, right? Because, because one, yeah. one, one future is that he leaves fighting and angry and tries to create an insurrection, but doesn't work, but becomes the head of Trump TV and becomes stronger exactly. than the opposition, become, become, continues to eat the Republican party, uh, which is towing the line with, with who he is. Um, and we'll get back to OGM in a second because this ties back to OGM. Um, and the other, the other notion is that he winds up being sort of a, a lonely, sad guy who no longer has much of a following except for a tiny hardcore like his, his Grand Armée uh, raggedly standing by him with you know, uh, Confederate flags and Trump banners but that he, he winds up being marginalized and that the Republican party needs to be reborn in some way, which is super interesting. And that we're, in, we're then in a moment where the radicalized right is more open to conversation, maybe. And this may just be wishful thinking on my part, but, but Trump has, has so eaten and loyalty to Trump has been so well-maintained, shockingly well-maintained over the last five years, six years, since, since, since the campaign, since Trump became the clear winner in the campaign, since the Republican convention in 2016, right? That, that's kind of when Trump said, I alone can fix this and you could see everybody fall in line. Uh, and so since then it's, it's been that way. So, so there may be a moment of softening of the, the, the digital divide because we've been shown how bad the chasm is by how evenly split the country is around this election. Klaus, you wanted to jump in. I have a more cynical perspective here. I think, uh, quickly? you know, I think for Mitch McConnell, this is the most perfect scenario. He's getting rid of this maniac uh, in the White House, uh, but uh, who, who he has supported in order to get his judges placed and in order to stall any kind of progress on climate change and other things that are in corporate interests. When, when, you, when you look at how the American population is controlled uh, by the media outlets, there are six corporations that own 90% of all corporate media. It's clearly on those corporations that the American public is uneducated on science and doesn't understand the, the, the science of climate change, of the pandemic and so on. Yeah, I mean, this, there, there are peripheral differences between what CNN is saying versus what Fox News is saying, but at the end of the day, um, 60% of the American public basically doesn't understand the science or simply rejects the science. So, so going forward, um, I, I, right now you have Biden and, and uh, teaming up with Nancy Pelosi or whoever will lead the Democratic Party you know, to initiate uh, going back to the Paris Accord and doing all these uh, things, you know, uh, redefining what is healthcare in the US, but at the end of the day, they will have to settle with Mitch McConnell. And Mitch McConnell is basically representing the corporate interests in the United States. I mean, that's how I see it. Um, last word on this theories here. And, and, and I will add that I occasionally have been tweeting over the last couple months that this is just my wishful thinking, but my hope is that on inauguration day in 2021, uh, Trump does not step off the podium off the dais, you know, watching the inauguration to go into a helicopter to take a slow, lazy turn over DC and, and go into retirement, but rather walks off the dais into the hands of marshals and, and handcuffs. Um, yeah, Jerry, I, I don't, I was trying to play out the, he becomes the, you know, Trump, Trump network. And uh, it's, it, I also feel very doomed by some of what's capable there and the the specter of Donald Trump Jr. or Donald, Tr you know, the d sort of dynasty situation. But the second they try to stand up, I think that 
that network, they basically start competing with Fox News. Which they're going to do now because they're so pissed at Fox anyway. I think he wants to take down Murdoch. I think that's a great schism to um, celebrate. To, to promote, to, because not everybody's going to follow him away from Fox and Murdoch. Yeah, a, a house divided. It's like possible. Yeah. Scott? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was... It, it's funny how this ties into what I was mentioning earlier with you before everyone got on the call about the simple use of language and how Trump has is speaking to a part of the country, which turns out to be a huge part of the country who simply can't understand the complex language. I was reading, I did a deep dive on literacy rates and literacy studies and what it found not only is that half the country is eighth grade reading level or below, he speaks at a fourth grade reading level. These people have not been spoken to in a way that they could understand. It's not that they don't know about the science, it's that they might not even be able to, to read it. But what, what I noticed, one other thing, Jerry, I didn't get to mention that was extremely telling to me was that they, they had a bar chart with the five levels of reading literacy and there were tests for each that they used to determine. But in this current study that they did, which was a couple of years ago, they combined four and five. It's now four slash five. So there's level one, two, three, was four and five. There's so few in the five that they combined them into one category, mm. which means that it's, it's sliding down even further. And that the people who can articulate a sentence of complexity, you know, they're up here. And the rest of the country can't even participate because it's like you're speaking, you know, a, well, you're like you're sitting in a, at an advanced biochemistry lecture. You know, it's English, but you don't know what's going on. And so that's that's just a hypothesis I'm working mm -hmm. on. I don't have much more than that. Uh, and I love that's why. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that's why metaphors are so important um, when we extract argumentation from media at the society library we have a special category for extracting metaphors because sometimes in news media you know they'll explain something and then they'll add a metaphor and like that may just be at the level that someone can co comprehend something and understand the point of it even if they don't understand all of the intricate details of the argumentation um but yeah i i i'm with you in that like people have different levels of familiarity with subject matter and so they have varying levels of being able to comprehend something and obviously limited time in which they could spend like getting to comprehension. So images, stories, something that explains to them the point um, without them having to understand complex argumentation. Uh, Stacy, jump in. And you're muted. There we yeah. go. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just wanted to say there's a whole nother part to that picture that has nothing to do, I don't think, with how smart somebody is or how literate they are. Um, I've spoken to a lot of people who are really, really intelligent. I think we underestimate the fact that we were given different sets of information and how much um, influence the messenger brings to the message. So when people viewed somebody that was screaming or angry or on the opposite side as them, they automatically closed them off. They didn't hear that message at all. And these things just weren't discussed. I talk to people that you guys would consider the lower level of intellect all the time, maybe just high school graduates. They are so much easier to persuade than anybody else. And, and not, not by lying. I don't mean the way Trump does. I mean by just asking them questions and having them think and come up with the answers. And I think that's what doesn't happen enough. Um, love that, Stacey. And, and so uh, stop me if you've all, I, I think I said this on a recent OGM call, but not a big one, uh, which was one of my favorite books in the world is The Great Transformation by Karl Polanyi, which was written in 1944. It's about the transformation from pre-industrial to early industrial society. It's a great book. <clears throat> and then Murray Rothbard, the head of the Mises Institute, so like an uber libertarian, wrote a six page letter, basically, that was supposed to be a review or a critique of the great transformation. And so I read it and it's not a review or a critique. It's basically a screed to get, to make sure that nobody, no good libertarian actually opens the cover and tries to read Polanyi because 
he knows that if they actually try to read Polanyi, Polanyi will make sense because Polanyi is an economic historian who's pulling up numbers and showing you what the hell happened. And the libertarian uh, script cannot actually bear scrutiny like that. So, so his, his whole letter is basically, uh, and, and in his letter, he accuses Polanyi of all the things, he accuses Polanyi of committing all the things he commits in the letter. <clears throat> it's, it's really quite interesting and brilliant and sad. Um, and so I, I tell this old story because um, a lot of smart people, and I don't think, I, I, th I think, I think it's dangerous to, to underestimate how smart some of Trump's followers actually are. Like, like you know, QAnon people, I've done the research is one of their quotes and they, they, they're going down rabbit holes. They can't tell sort of conspiracy theory from fact, but they're like logicking the hell out of this and they'll argue you into a corner for, for days. So I think part of what's been done really, really effectively is walling off conversations, walling off whole bodies of thinking. Like not only was communism demonized in the 50s and 60s, but so was socialism. And, and you know, now we have democratic socialists like AOC and the squad kind of in, in the game and the far right is freaked out about this and trying really hard to say, no, but socialism, no, but socialism. And everybody's starting to slowly go, you know, maybe socialism isn't evil like we've been told for 50 goddamn years. And so I, th I think that that's the opportunity here is that, is that some of this is chipping away and breaking down because people have been scared away from, from, from having some of these conversations. And maybe we're a little past that because the wicked, I was just watching on YouTube, the scene where the wicked witch melts, where she lights the, the straw man on fire and Dorothy takes the bucket and puts out the fire, but then water comes all over the witch and she melts and I'm like, I think if Trump, and, and this is why I'm interested in how Trump steps off stage, if Trump melts in a way that's really debilitating to the, that this facade of holding back a bunch of thinking and talking, that's a really good thing, I think. Judy, uh, you're muted. Apologies. Uh, there's a big piece of it actually that is the process, the brain files things that are heard orally and it files in a like area. There's been research at MIT in terms of messages and stories and other things. And essentially the brain stores information next to consistent adjacent information. And so if you're heavily indoctrinated by a particular culture with its values, in addition to the sociological dimension of not wanting to break away from your friends, it's actually harder to hear and store and retain information that doesn't fit with the story you already know. And so it seems to me that part of what we would want to do is actually get to the oral histories and, and find mechanisms in fourth grade level or children level language, simple stories, cartoons, whatever they might be that would help develop the zone in the brain that hears those messages and starts a different file. And sorry, that sounded and this is an important OGM conversation, actually, because if a piece of what we think we're trying to do is bridge the cultural divide and help people who otherwise one another in both directions have better conversations and make better decisions, this is super essential stuff. Like, like, and, and, and how the next months play out, I think, is really important to the future of the nation. Um, and if there's a way we can help that tip one way or the other, like count, <clears throat> count me in, right? Just count me in big time. Maybe it's TikTok. Uh, you mean that we should be making TikTok videos? I, I'm totally not averse to that. I think this, uh, it, took, I mean, it has you know, a huge following at all ranges of education. It's not just kids. I mean, there's 70 year olds, et cetera. They're all racking up TikToks. So the trick is to figure out how to get it into their stream and make it funny and entertaining enough that they listen. Right, and, and it took me a really long time to see a single TikTok video that was worth actually like listening to with Absolutely. Your, like, like brain on. Um, but one of them was a young woman who was basically doing a makeup video and she's busy curling her, her eyelash and talking about how China is basically in, you know, uh, imprisoning the Uyghurs. And I'm like, wait, what? Uh, it was brilliant. It was a total hack of the system. TikTok is advertising at me on YouTube under the banner of, I learned it on TikTok. Like Whoa. about TikTok is an educational platform. Think of it that way. Yeah. I was this, this, I was today years old when I learned blank is kind of their motto, you know, that taking from that meme. That's amazing. Love that. 
Um, last word on this particular topic, which I think we'll come back to in some sense because this is this is fertile ground for for things we need to do. So let's let I'd love to just open the conversation about what to do about what we created in the workshop. Um, and I know that I'm on team one, so I know that um, Charles has put a whole bunch of work, and Ken went went into we we have a Miro board which we presented with the uh, with the eggs. Uh, that has become more elaborated and the summaries are in and so forth. And so, so team one I know has been working on perfecting or improving uh, its, its results. And, and that's just kind of one stage. Like, do we all, do all the teams need to go do that and then come back together to another presentation or um, are there other paths? Um, how do we include the things that people contributed to the conversation before the event started? Uh, how does that get woven into the conversation? How does all of that get boiled down toward answering the questions that Matt had posed uh, about who are we, how do we explain ourselves. Um, my wife, who is one of my best critics, uh, read my essay contribution and said, yeah, but you don't actually at any point say what OGM is. And I'm like, damn it. Um, so things like that. So let but, me but just- But you, you said it immediately afterwards in the conference. Immediately afterwards, exactly. Uh, that's, that's the problem, it's gotta be in the thing. Um, so, how do we uh, distill this? I'm, I'm just opening the floor to whoever would like to propose different way, different approaches for doing this. Judy, you're, you're starting. Well, I, I'm just, I'm still partly connecting the other conversation to this, but I think if we really want, I think we need to start with the simple and then elaborate and go to not the big picture in all of its complexity, which we all resonate to because it's, it's what do we do? I think we need to go reductionist and get to the simplest possible messages about who we are. And they then make sure that they're in every, you know, they're oral, they're written, and they're video. Um, there's a, there's a uh, well-known pattern in uh, Agile or what was called extreme programming before that, which is do the simplest thing that could possibly work, uh, which is sort of what you're advocating here. Kim. I think it might be useful if um, if we ask each team to please review their stuff and come up with maybe three different levels, um, a, a complete distillation list, here's the simplest thing, and then a more uh, a, a little bit more fleshed out like a single page, and then they can have, you know, whatever they want for additional backup materials. But uh, if we get it down to that, then we can have a, a more uh, coherent conversation between all of us because there's so much stuff. I've been looking through the folders going, I thought I'd go through and sort of sort this. It's just, it's overwhelming. So it's if a each lot of team stuff. would go through and say, here's what we think is the absolute distillation. Here's the it's a one page that kind of sums it. And then here's the, the, uh, the backup material for that. That'd be really useful. I would add to that assignment, uh, since the teams have seen each other pitch, um, some effort to join the middle. So some effort to take their own initiatives and, and meld them into uh, the larger whole, whatever that larger whole is, but 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 um, not just to represent what their team did, but then to integrate in in some way. I think that would be helpful because that's kind of where we need to head. Well, we yeah, do we have a central repository that. or collection. Sorry, first where Ken, we first Ken then Max. Go Ken. Go ahead, Ken. I, I was just going to say that was sort of what my next. If each team does that, then we're going to have a conversation to figure out how we do meld all that together. So just that's sort of a prerequisite for having that conversation. Exactly, exactly. I'm just trying to get the teams to start thinking about that second conversation. Sorry, Max, go ahead. Just saying, echoing Ken, it's hard to think about that conversation until I can look at the material from the other teams. Yep. Uh, well, we have, we have uh, first we, we got a piece of the other teams by listening during the workshop at the end as we presented to each other. So we've, we've been exposed and all the materials should be collecting up in the, in the folders and so forth, but the summaries will help vastly. Remind me about the folders. Uh, I put, I think in the last invite, uh, a link to our shared Google Drive, which has the, all the work products and will have all the recordings uh, for uh, the workshop and the breakouts. And I intend to uh, publish all of the videos to YouTube as I usually do for our calls. It's just been too many moving parts. So I haven't gotten to that. Um, can somebody refresh or send the link to that drive folder in the chat. Yes, please. please. It should be in, it should be in my last, in, I think I put it in my last invite for this call. 
You did. Uh, cool. Good. Other thoughts along this topic? I'm, I'm counting that somebody's going to find the link and, and post it. I'll do that. Um, Jamie, do you want to explain? Oh, yeah. Sorry. I'm, I'm in a, a, a lift right now. Uh, <laughs> um, so I was just saying that uh, in another group where, where we're looking to find alignment between different projects, it was proposed uh, earlier today, actually, that everyone just lists out like the features and goals. And so as, as much as possible, and that may be easy to grok just from looking at how people had organized their own content, just choose the highest level items and then map that out into a matrix. And then everyone can at least like identify like where their leaning is, whether it's like, you know, crowdsourcing curation, if we want to focus on the environment, if we want to focus on community, and then people can clearly see like with whom they align on certain things. And then perhaps those groups with overlap can break out into their own groups and then more fully flesh out and develop their own ideas because they're the ones who happen to like really highly align with the concept of community or the concept of creating tools or something like that. Um, can you describe the dimensions of the matrix? Because because uh, when you said let's build a matrix, the first one I thought was let's take um, Matt's questions down the left and our teams across the top, and then let's see how each team is answering each question, and then let's try to distill them over to the right. And that I don't think that's what you were saying at all. Okay, so getting out of the lift now. <laughs> um, so yeah, so given that we've already, and thank you so much, by the way, you have a great day. Um, so given that, <laughs> I'm such a jerk. Um, so given that um, we've already asked those questions and we went through the exercise of answering those questions and people talked about, you know, what we were going to do five years from now, was it going to be, uh, you know, did we focus on community first? Did we build out a common set of tools? Did we focus on data architecture so we could have, uh, you know, this federated knowledge garden? So essentially fleshing out the highest level answers to those questions on a column to the left and then names on the top right. And then just finding the groups of people who align. Um, so maybe instead of finding alignment within the groups that they were assigned, find alignment between groups of people who agree on those subjects and then break off into these new groups where like within those groups, they can start fleshing out the ideas of the things that they prioritize and find really important. So Does I that make think, sense? I think you're suggesting a way for us to find our way into interest groups or project groups or what Matt might call buckets, which makes good sense to me as well. Marc-Antoine? Just... Uh... I think it's a great idea. It, how we had done it in this other group, because I was there also, it was more about we're one bucket and we need to align. So it was about finding points of divergence and making sure. In this case, it's very different because I don't think we're trying to exclude anything. It's more about finding a kind of committees and we are connecting connectors which I think is the agreed goal. <laughs> but, but certainly there is a notion of uh, priority and focus, which is, I don't think we want to exclude anything, but we do want to choose priority and focus. And that, I don't know if matrix is the best way to do it. It's more about seeing which effort is going to help which effort. And I think that map is really interesting. Like if we have all these efforts, which one contributes the most as a prerequisite to which other effort? And it's more about doing a kind of priority chart than saying, we're not doing this. And I, and I think that a matrix that sorts us into project groups or interest groups is useful, but doesn't help us converge on how the hell do we explain ourselves in the next elevator ride? Jamie, that was great that you were in a lift. Um, but what is our elevator pitch? when somebody says, hey, what is this OGM thing you're spending time on, right? Which we don't, which we don't have yet. Um, and I think is a, is a useful collective exercise so that we can, we can uh, have more and more sort of unison or more sense of what we're up to together. You gave the elevator pitch, I keep telling you. <laughs> so you're saying we're, we're connectors of connectors and- Connectors of connectors, connect we're connecting. We're connecting connectors, we're connecting ideas, we're connecting viewpoints, we're connecting also, tools, like the methodologies. I, which I like a lot, but, uh, but it hasn't been generally discussed. But uh, I, I think you and I are fans of that. Well, that's how I see and it. Lauren. I mean, it it's, it's sort of forming connections on every possible level to do every possible thing. And trying to map that's impossible. But, but to define, you know, if we could take, you know, why, what, who, et cetera, down to three words, that says what you said about the whole in terms of why we exist, what we're useful for, et cetera, um, it, whatever language works best, then we've got our TikTok video. We've got something that we can all 
look at and say, okay, I'm gonna pull this corner and go do something. Does anybody wanna join me over here? But I think the idea of, of boiling our mission down to a TikTok video is very nice. I think that would be um, lovely to have. And we'd be like, yeah, here's an explanation of what we're up to. And I'd be totally happy to work on that. Um, and I just wrote into the, into the chat, reconnecting. Um, because this is just, just comes from my amateur view of history, that in many cases we were well connected before. We had a, we have robust fabric of, of, of society in lots of places, which we have shredded through a variety of different forces. Uh, the most important of which in the last week or so is this, you know, schism being driven between the far right and everybody else. Um, so, so to me, connecting is also about con bridging or connecting over political differences, emotional differences, party affiliations, tribal differences, that's a really as, as important a part of connecting, which is why I said reconnecting society as opposed to connecting information. There's a piece though that I think, I, I love what we're talking about, but is, is there a way to just be the future, be the connection of diversity in how we tackle it and represent that in the messaging and something that's powerful because I think we all have human needs and we share those human needs. And if we could connect around, we need the same things, guys, let's figure out how to do it. Maybe we'd have a more productive ability to move instead of staying polarized and trying to convert people and things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Mark Antoine? The, the, no, I just want to point out, I mean, Things are happening in parallel, of course, in the chat always, but I think this one is worth surfacing. Uh, Scott asked, connecting is our essence. How does that include content creation? And my reply to that was, I think that connections, like building connections, they're embodied in new stories. And, 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 and creating stories and forging stories is how we embody new links. And that way, that link is very intimate between connection and content creation. Um, and, and sometimes it will be embodying also the new story, uh, as was just said. But uh, I think this storytelling link is important. That's all I want to surface. I love that. And I want to build on that, which is connecting. <clears throat> I think connecting implies the existence, the pre-existence of entities that you're connecting, right? Because if we're mostly connectors, not originators of content, for example, like, like we're going we're gonna to create uh, the new content that's going to change the world is a different mission. But, 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 we're, but connectors presupposes that there's a bunch of bodies of work that aren't really connected yet that could use connection, that everybody will benefit from that connection being made. Like that, that's, that, that makes me happy just thinking about it that way. And then, but, but then ironically, sometimes the best way to weave those connections and to make them apparent is to build original uh, stories, uh, you know, and, and, and here with Jay's, you know, presence uh, in our group a lot and, and us all caring a lot about storytelling, I think that, that stories are, are one of the principal ways of weaving those connections and, and illustrating for other people in some easily transmissible, portable, uh, you know, linkable way how the newly connected thing works and is different and is better and is a thing we should sort of move toward because the reason for doing the weaving and the connecting is to shift people's mindsets towards seeing each other as part of this, this being on the same team trying to fix the trying to fix what's broken together as opposed to being on opposite teams that fear and dread one another and have been taught to you know see the other as inhuman so one of the one there's this book on killing that I refer to now and then. And one of the first things you do to military is you make sure that you desensitize them to the, to the enemy being even human. They have green blood, they, they eat their children, Wh whatever kind of myths you can create to make sure that you don't see that the other person is human is, is critical to getting people to kill people because people don't normally want to kill people. And then, and then small second story from the same book. If you're a sniper and you shoot somebody, the worst thing in the world you can do is walk over and see your victim and, and open their wallet and see a picture of their family. Like psychologically, that's incredibly destructive, thank God. Um, but, 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 and, and, and also snipers are seen usually as misfits in military units. Snipers like, whew, that person, because they're just aiming to kill from a distance and that's all that they do and they're loners. 
Um, and so, the, so the, uh, there's a whole bunch of weird psychology around this. Um, so how to be, how to evoke this notion of productive connections, uh, storytelling for connections, data sharing and linking for connections, and where the OGM task in the weaving is to find and build what's missing and to not build it if somebody else has already done it. Like, like I, I want us to never, you know, as much as possible, not reinvent the wheel. Because inventing wheels and trying to make wheels turn is very resource consumptive and time consumptive. So if somebody else is already doing something, let's help them do it better. Let's, let's click them into the larger picture of how things are moving. Scott. Um, I, I was wondering about the content creation and, and you guys have sparked something for me in that I think a lot of your presentations, Jerry, a lot of the TED Talks I watch, a lot of conversations that the, the, the connecting is the content. So they're, they're saying, oh, this thing over here and this thing over here, you never really realized how they connected. And so, so I'm now kind of backpedaling and saying, oh, I can see how the connection connecting is, is the content. And, and the contrasting of stories helps us rewire those connections and realize, oh, wait, my assumptions about how this works were maybe a little backwards or, or oh, there's a different way of seeing the situation or those light bulbs, those kind of aha moments, I think are the payoff moments of, of OGM work, right? When somebody goes, oh, I see that differently now, that's great. Um, and then uh, I'll go to you in a second, Romer. Uh, and then the, Chris Voss, the hostage negotiator, says that you know you're making progress when the other person, the, the hostage taker that you're negotiating with says, that's right. Because, and your goal is, your goal is to say something that describes the world as they see it. And when they say, yeah, that's right. You've made progress in the hostage negotiation. And in fact, the first time they say no is also progress. Chris Voss says no is the first step toward getting somewhere. Because the moment somebody has said no to you, they feel more comfortable, they can relax, they feel more powerful. You can then enter the conversation differently. Romer. Yeah, I think you're already heading on to my thoughts, Jerry, because the other part of uh, connection is how do we strengthen it? So uh, I, I guess that's the added part that I, I'd like to, uh, for us to think about is strengthening the uh, connections. Agreed, uh, Ken. So I have this um, theory that I've been testing over the last couple of years that asking how is actually not the best strategy because I think we are trained in a sort of engineering mindset of a problem solution mindset. So, you know, how do we do this? And it puts us into a problem solving mode. Um, so I found it to be really useful to ask people, what would it look like if it was working, which opens up an imaginative dimension. And then once we've sort of said, well, it would look like this, you know, we'd see these things. Then we can backtrack and say, how do we make that happen? So I just want to throw that in as a, as a, a, a useful thinking tool. Thank you. And I'm a fan, Russ Acuff, one of my mentors and, and a big system thinker, had a process he called idealized redesign, which was kind of a way of doing exactly that. He got people to, and it took a long time to get people to let go of the present enough to imagine mm -hmm. a future they wanted together. And then from that to work their way back toward reality. So that's, um, that's where stuff like improv comes in, where you just get people out of their normal mode. And you do the, you know, the, the tree thing, you know, um, I'm a tree, I'm a bird, I'm, I'm a picnic. And then, you know, who are you going to leave with? And just stuff that breaks us out of our normal thinking habits for 20 minutes or so, and then get into an imaginative mode is really, really effective. So we did um, a lot of this in a very coordinated way last Thursday. Um, and it seems like the question amongst us is, um, how do we synthesize it? And it seems to me that's a slightly a conversation of, of process. And um, I think of it in a couple of ways, you know, um, one of them is, is it fair to assume that everyone on this call wants to participate in the synthesis? Or another way of asking would be like, how many hours do people want to put into that effort? And then we can kind of understand our, our resource levels. Um, I'm, a, I'm unclear that every team wants to reconstitute and push harder on what they did. So I think that's a great start. Uh, a great assumption is like, let's not assume everybody's going to go uh, enthusiastically do that. I, I personally just 
am very, this is the part of the process that I love the most is, is the synthesis and the joining and the, the shared mental modeling. And um, I'm, I've been chomping at the bit for the last week to get access to other people's stuff and see who's interested and want to like join it all together. So I'm interested in putting 10 to 20 hours on this over the next couple of weeks or a, you know, a surge sprint in the next whatever, depending on our, our time constraints. But that's kind of like where I'm coming into the, at a resource level. I'd be interested to hear what other people are feeling in terms of commitment to a synthesis process. So Judy had mentioned really being interested in helping synthesize, and I know that I am. And so a different approach might be to, to ask the teams to elaborate or, or perfect what they've done in any way they want to. Just, you know, and if they don't want to, that's fine too. But then to pull together a separate call, a little, a little, a little team that's, that's a synthesis team to go out and look at all their works and pull together things and try to create artifacts that express what we're seeing and what we think it boils down to um, to the greater OGM. I think that'd be awesome. Anybody else? Uh, absolutely. And I think it's funny looking around the group, you can see the people who are, you know, just like you, Max, are like, ooh, mm -hmm. ooh, yeah, yeah. And and I know from experience that you're absolutely right. There are people who are happy to do this, but not as happy to do this. And I think we have a group here that's largely ready to, oh yeah, yeah, this that's that's dive in and do this. It's high leverage work. And, but the beauty is if we do it right, everyone will go, oh, I didn't know you could say it so easily. Because it exactly. will be all encompassing and, and allow all of the divergence that's the richness of the actual implementation and action. Uh, Lauren? Yeah, I'd definitely be willing to put in a good amount of time um, what I usually like to do is if I can listen to what's been going on and usually I do this in order and then I highlight as it goes because it allows me to highlight the script. Um, that's definitely something I would be willing to do to help um, at least give my opinion on what's um, harvestable. Thank you. And also because we're doing OGM kind of work and, uh, and several of you, uh, Pete and you guys at Kiko Lab have been doing transcriptions and then have been using, the, and Max, you took the transcriptions and put them in Miro and know how to program that. Like the idea of using our tools to actually come back to the raw pieces of conversation that are behind some of the things we synthesize too. So, so not just to do the exercise of synthesis, but to be able to then trace it back to the workshop recordings and other sorts of things. I, I'm, I, doing it right and doing it perfectly would be an enormous amount of work, but just getting a taste of what that is like would, would I think be super interesting and helpful as well. Uh, Marc Antoine? Um, I suspect the next step after we've gone through the, this exercise of each team distilling and everybody listening to that, maybe we'll have more than one synthesis. I mean, uh, this kind of group, I mean, I expect a choral synthesis <laughs> to use uh, Caulfield's terms. Yeah, and, and also, I mean, this is a little bit like the three blind men describing the elephant. <clears throat> um, and the mission and scope of OGM are big and broad enough and slightly political enough that lots of people are gonna have different sort of uh, feelings about how to participate or what to do. And then our interests are at very different levels. And I, I love how Neil keeps trying to get us back to th sort of thinking in terms of those levels and being a little bit more explicit about those levels. Uh, but, but some of us are really interested in how do, we change, how do we get rid of politics and go back to governance with a little G. That's one of my missions is like politics has become mass market. Uh, so one of my insights uh, since the election was I love the Lincoln Project videos. I was like eating them up. And it turns out that they were spending a whole bunch of time and money entertaining the left. That I don't think they moved the dial on anybody who was on the right. I think that, that there was like an impermeability to the Lincoln Project. And, and, and so I'm like, wow, okay, wait. And, and then I had a second realization, which was um, they were using consumer mass marketing. They, they, were, they were basically ad ad strategists, political advertising strategists who are doing exactly that, running ads and running them against, you know, uh, consumers basically of, of, of government, as opposed to the thing that we might need, which is governance, which involves actually sitting down with people and saying, what's, what's happening with you? And the interesting projects I've found that have changed some minds have been patient, have been going out asking people and empathizing with them in their situations. There's one group 
that was doing uh, canvassing, but they intentionally were slow canvassers and they would go through, a, I've, got, I've got to find the group in my brain, but um, they intentionally were, were moving slowly. And they said in, in a 15 minute conversation, you can actually change some minds because you've actually heard them. And a 15 minute conversation is very different from a lasting relationship where you're actually providing resources and helping people change their, the, the world around them, which I think is essential. Like, like part, of the, part of the problem here is that a whole bunch of Americans feel like they've been abandoned and left adrift and all somebody wants is their vote and then screw them. Like once they voted bye-bye, who cares about you and your future anyway? And I think the opposite is, is true for, for, for all of us here. Go ahead, Judy. There's an important dimension that we've mentioned several times, but I wanna highlight. And that is that if we want to engage the largest number of people in a meaningful way, the messages need to continue to be simple so that they can actually do something that they feel good about because the engagement itself is really powerful. And so if, if we can identify opportunities of things you can do with your neighbor or things you can do with your sister-in-law or whatever that are simple, constructive, positive motion in this complicated, screwed up world, then I think we can build a, a, a wholesome swell from the bottom that won't feel to anybody like it's a push from the top, which is what people are resisting. And the good news is that there's a bunch of groups in the world doing, trying to do exactly what you just described. So partly we have to build bridges to them, bring them into this conversation, learn from, learn from what they've done, adapt, appropriate, and articulate and amplify what they've done so that everybody hears about it, for example, right? And, 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 and then lather, rinse, repeat on that. Uh, Ken. Can you hear me? Am I muted? Yes. Okay, because um, I'm on the phone. Uh, I'm going to go back a couple minutes. This conversations on this, these calls move so quickly. It's like trying to, you know, grab something out of a, out of flowing, rapidly flowing river. I just wanted to offer uh, this story. I don't know if it's true. It might be apocryphal, but I heard that when he was in uh, seminary, uh, it, uh, Yates had a final exam on transubstantiation. He spent two hours just staring out the window and the proctor came by and said, you have two minutes left. And he's alleged to have written upon meeting its maker, the water blushed. And I can't think of anything more succinctly said than that. So I would love us to come up with some Yatesian uh, ways of expressing what OGM is. And we're under using, under playing, under thinking or under feeling um, art, soma, physical presence, physical body, all of those kinds of things in our work together. And I would love for us to range more widely into those forms of expressions and ways of being together and, and all of that. I'm not really, exactly sure even what that and, means. And Go children's ahead, Scott. art especially. Uh, really quick, I think that relates to Jamie's comment earlier about the use of metaphor and the way that that can, can bridge many levels. Which, which brings us back to what we were talking about when the whole, before everybody showed up, Scott, which is sort of like the simplicity of Trump's language <clears throat> as, from my perspective, an extremely intentional thing. If, if you watch old videos of Trump, he looks like a tall, thin, real, like greedy real estate guy who, who's very articulate. And there, there's interviews of him all over because he loves the media. He's been on the air so long. Um, and, and I think that his conversion to the caricature that he is today was A, quite intentional, and B, then ate his character. So that I don't think he has, I don't think he has any wiggle room to suddenly drop persona, drop character, and go back to what he was. I think he, I think he has become the thing he created um, in a very weird way. But, but, but I think it was more intentional than most people think. Lauren, uh, I was just listening to George Lakoff today, and um, one thing that he describes in his book, "Don't Think of an Elephant" or something like that. Um, is really helpful. And what he's talking about is how the right has really heavily invested in the infrastructure and architecture for framing. And they spend big money on this and they give block grants, which are these huge grants where they don't um, pester people to um, prove that they've um, provided services to people. So they actually can use that for things like um, developing uh, like social 
uh, ties and professional development and hiring intellectuals to think about things and to um, actually build that infrastructure that we're trying to build that there's no money for on the left. So it's just not that important. And about how in, um, uh, you know, uh, on the right, like it, it, in campaign offices, you have to like put money into jar every time you use like a bad phrase, they don't, you know, like if you say tax cuts instead of tax relief. And so I, I wouldn't just say that um, these politicians are just using these like easy phrases or they're so talented that the, the, I would go further and say they're building on this massive advertising infrastructure that they've used so that every issue is framed how they want it to be framed. So, you know, we don't have that and we don't have that infrastructure. We don't have funders who understand that that infrastructure is important. So that I think a, that's part of the story is what I'm saying that we have to get the message to funders that the way that they're funding these things is just nonsense. So three thoughts and then I'll go to Marc Antoine. Uh, um, one of which is I have a long sort of thread of, of thoughts in my brain that go back to the 1964 thwomping of Goldwater in the US elections. Goldwater lost and the Republicans had a major crisis they were like, this is, we're, we're losing, this is bad. And they then invented uh, the Hoover Institution, the AEI, a whole bunch of really important think tanks now. Uh, they then bought like all of AM radio and turned it all into, into extremely conservative talk radio. The evangelicals joined the parade because they wanted you know, abortion laws to be wiped out, et cetera, et cetera, or to be passed to prevent. I mean, all the single issue, whether it was guns or, or, or uh, right to life or whatever else, all of these things came together and built, and then they understood how mainstream media affects modern media better than the left did. And they built this incredible echo chamber where something can start on Breitbart, end up on Fox News, and then it has to be covered on CNN, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the left was like, wah, wah, wah. Um, and so I, I totally agree with that. And I'm trying to figure out how to undermine that so that, so that the left doesn't come up with an equivalent uh, you know, mechanism to counteract it, but rather so that the left actually goes and solves problems and reweaves re community and a sense of trust across people so that we can solve the problem outside of politics and, and mass marketing. So, so because one of my big ahas about the, the Lincoln project was, oh crap, that was really compelling to me. It was a lot of money spent. It did nothing. At least, I, at least my sense of it is they were advertising to the left, not to the right. So I'm, tr I'm trying to figure out how do we actually move the needle on changing people's lives on the ground or not doing it for them, helping people change their own lives on the ground uh, in ways that we can help channel resources and, and wisdom and insights and data to them so they can just go pick up and fix stuff, right? And then, and then last thought that sparked up was, um, I've got this idea I call design from trust. And I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's the relationship between design from trust and OGM. Because on the one hand, design from trust is sort of this sort of moral ethical theory about design and uh, how we all might sort of go redesign our world together for the, for the good. Um, on the other hand, there's plenty of other theories about how to fix things and what to do. Uh, so I could use some guidance about like what, to, uh, maybe d design from trust becomes a, a subtopic or a subgroup that OG some OGMers are interested in and go pursue as we sort ourselves into buckets and figure out what to do. But for me, design from trust is an extremely needy solution to the thing I just described. Meaning if we can show communities how to design from trust and how to see the design from mistrust that's in their world and how to replace institutions and fix stuff and then trickle that back up to vote for people to change government, that could work over the long term in the same way that the conservative strategy worked over 30 years from 1964. And one last thing on that is that there's this incredible irony, which is that all of this work that conservatives did to own the conversation, to, to, to run the table, to, to do all that, kind of got broken badly just now in this electoral cycle. It, it's, it's like they, they sort of gave a lot of that up to put Amy Comey Barrett on in a, in a, in a chair to get a 6-3 majority on, on the Supreme Court. 
And then all the wheels fell off the cart after that. And the good news for conservatives is they still own most of the state legislatures. There's, there's still lots of power there, but, but this thing is kind of broken. And to me, you know, that's where the cracks are where the light shines in. So there, there's an opportunity here to figure out how to piece these things together and to offer better solutions. And to me, those solutions aren't advertising messages. Although the, the quick TikTok video that explains what we're thinking is like, I'm totally into that. But, but I think that we actually have to change things on the ground. Uh, Marc-Antoine then Klaus. Okay. Um, first, it is fascinating, isn't it, that the people who took over messaging for the left was a right-wing group. <laughs> Uh, and because that's what this kind of messaging is. And we spoke yesterday, and I want to get back on that, about the inherent difficulty of messaging and making a soundbite out of a more complex vision, a more nuanced vision, a more diverse vision. And this is the difficulty of, even if we had those think tanks and those um, marketing uh, apparatus, could we uh, tell the story we want to tell, which is more, but I think we were speaking about that, right? Uh, I remember reading this analysis of um, the discourse of Martin Luther King, how there were all these layers, like there was a very simple layer, but the other layers were there and interwoven. And I think when we speak about um, making connections, I think making the connections around layers of complexity is also what we need to be able to do. It's not easy. I'm not saying this is not a recipe, but I'm saying we need to have the pith, the pith statement, but it needs to be interwoven and pointing to the, the more, the larger story, which is what we do want to tell ultimately. So it has to be kind of inviting people into a, a larger narrative. I don't know, this is not a solution, but I'm just trying to mm -hmm. delineate the problem here. And, uh, yeah. And I think we'll know we're getting somewhere when the stories that we're distilling make our, the conceptual thinkers in our, in our group happy and the let's go do it people in our group happy as well. Like if, if we can find something that resonates at, at very different levels of abstraction and action, then we're like, I think we're really finding something that that brings us together and that explains what we're up to. Plus, yeah, listening in, I, I think we can agree that climate change is the overarching uh, issue that that we're, that we're battling because it is it is really uh, uh, pushing us towards the edge. And what I can see, you know, with the NGOs I'm working with, uh, and and, and engaged in with so many other groups, what we're trying to accomplish is to change the conversation in the food system or agriculture environmental system to become as complex and diverse as it was has been achieved in the energy systems over decades, right? Because in the 90s, for 80s and 90s, it became clear that we could not continue to grow uh, energy usage per capita uh, the way it was it was happening then. So there was a concerted effort to educate the population on driving a more gas efficient car, to insulate your house, you know, to put in double pane windows and so on and so on. So energy is understood by the general population as a complex system. And there are participants who don't understand the entire system. They understand their car. You know, they understand the insulation in their home uh, and they don't need to know more because that changes their behavior. So in food, you now we're working now on multiple levels. For example, um, changing your, your eating habits and your buying habits to aid your personal health to build resilience against the coronavirus, for example, is just as useful as explaining to someone else who is environmentally motivated, right? So there are multiple levels that can be stitched together into one big story and then broken down into TikTok stories that address specific population segments. So, so just, just to you know, think about directionally. Uh, I like that. Um, a brief thing you, you reminded me of, I would love to create a short 
TikTok, a short video that basically takes Pascal's wager about climate change. So Pascal's wager is, you know, in this debate about whether or not there is a God, your safe bet is to say there is a God because if you're wrong, you're going to hell and that's gonna suck. Uh, if you're right, you know, what, what are you losing in some sense? Although I actually disagree with that entirely because being right and joining a religious movement means you've suddenly fallen into the framework and everything about that religious movement. But anyway, um, but for me, I don't understand. Uh, I, I was in a room uh, years ago and Al Gore was speaking and the first sentence out of his mouth is, I don't understand why conservatives don't see uh, greening the world as the hugest business opportunity since electrification. I don't, I don't get that that's not making it through, right? And, 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 and so the, the one, one way of looking at this is a less, less loss. Like we don't want you to buy a big car. We don't want you to drive so much. We don't want you to do all these things. Another way is to transmute what they do into things that feel like more, feel like abundance, feel like diversity, feel like better health. And I think that the, the tap into how to be healthier so you don't catch uh, COVID is a really good angle on that, for example. Go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, the, the, just to your comment about I'll go and not understanding the business opportunities, but the companies don't understand the business opportunities. In the food business, it's the same story as it is for the oil industry and the fossil fuel industry. You change it, they're out of business. You know, if we if we adapt the food system the way it has to be adapted, you see Nestle and Coca-Cola and yeah. Pepsi Cola and so on out of business. I mean, in their current business model, and some of them will have very difficult uh, uh, times to adjust to where the uh, where the system has to be moved to. So you have that same reluctance and pushback in the food system as there is in the energy system. This is also reflected at the micro level. Um, I, Dave Witzel and his wife and I visited uh, sing, singing frog farms in uh, out near Sebastopol, California. And it's a, green, it's a totally green farm. They're doing really interesting stuff. <clears throat> and all the farms around them are still doing industrial farming. And, and in listening to the stories of how they did their farm, and it was like three years old, four years old, they were doing great. Um, one of the things that really whacked me on the side of the head was, they've made permanent enemies of the dude that sells fertilizer and the dude that sells John Deere tractors and the dude that sells, you know, seeds from Monsanto downtown. And, and these are the dudes that are wealthy and maybe are holding public office and maybe whatever, but, but, but by, shifting, by shifting their practices, um, they've made the earth better, they're, they're storing rainwater, they're doing a whole bunch of really good stuff, they're growing healthier food, but, but they sort of made enemies all around them. Um, and, and, and they're slowly waning converts merely by, by you know, uh, she, she tells one of the, the, the wife of, of the couple who founded the place tells a story that there was a huge rainstorm and there were floods and she got a call from the neighbor saying, we're, you know, we haven't pulled the, the crop in yet, but we're flooding here. Do you need help? And, and she was sitting near the fireplace flipping through a book because healthy soil absorbs water like crazy and their farm was doing fine. Their, their, their plot, their few acres, you know, smaller than the neighboring farm, wasn't suffering from, uh, from the flood because they'd repaired the soil, right? But, but, but how that trickles up, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, uh, is the Jamie, uh, Jamie's still there. Thanks for being on the call and uh, through elevators and street traffic and thick and thin, that's awesome. Um, and let's, let's maybe boil down what we've been talking about into a couple of steps to take because I, I like what we're talking about, I would I'd like to get slightly more solid handles on it. I think I'm going to start by proposing. I think this means that a subgroup of us um, gets together and starts being a synthesis team and should have a call and meet and figure out what that is. And Stacy, I just noticed you have your hand up. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I just wanted to go back to what you had mentioned about COVID, because I think that is a really good opportunity. Of the people that I know that I said, you know, they're very intelligent, and yet they're totally on the other side, they're really fixed, aside from the fact that some of them have been brainwashed into thinking that COVID was a hoax or whatever, they really are into the idea of um, developing our immune system. And I think that plays into the farming and would motivate people to be on the same side when it comes to changing the way our farming industry is. I think that's a really good place to tap into. So I think at some point we also need to curate a list of um, 
I'm just going to call it TikTok videos, but, but a, a list of small stories that we'd be enthused to create and put in the world um, as experiments. And, uh, and this would be one of them, which is maybe the, the, link, the, the link between uh, your own health, avoiding COVID, soil fertility, better food, et cetera. Like, like, can we weave that together into some story? Can we manifest it in a series of different ways using OGM's variety of tools? So can we not only like tell a good story and, and whatever, but also show a systems diagram in Kumu that says, by the way, if you do this, it does that, et cetera. Like, I don't know. And uh, I'm just trying to say, can we build some experiments around these stories and then organize ourselves. So you just go do those things, put them in the world and see what happens. Mark Antoine, go ahead. And that, and that's very then, interesting. Like instead of finding the, uh, how to resolve the difference, find the points of pre prior alignment and build on them. I mean, I'm reminded of uh, Rawls saying that we build tolerance for other viewpoints by working with them on what he calls overlapping consensus, that is those points where there's overlap on what to do even if there's no overlap on the reasons why to do it <laughs> or, or the underlying theory of the world, but at least then you build this familiarity, which can then build into, uh, you know, Modus Vivendi builds into overlapping consensus and walls, but whatever. The, the, but building on those points of intersection sounds great. That's part of the connections. Thank you. Just to amplify uh, Ken, what, uh, sorry, Judy, then Ken. Just to amplify on what Jerry said and what you said, I think that if we can do really simple stories, you know, positive cartoons, another part of engagement is making it seem like it is possible because it's hopeful. You know, so short, hopeful stories <laughs> um, in our messaging would go a long way because there's not a lot of hopeful stuff coming out these days. Yeah, very much so. And, and there's good reason to be hopeful in lots of different ways. I think there's opportunity. There's, there's, there's lots of opportunity to do that. And I just typed into the chat one thing I meant to say, which is I would be extremely interested in different people's opinions on the workshop results. So as we synthesize things, we don't need to synthesize toward only one canonical result. And we already said there might be two different major narratives or whatever that come out, but there might be 15 different sub stories <clears throat> uh, that are super interesting to us of people who say, I, it's, it's like what I think of story threaders doing. I, I saw these nuggets on the ground that aren't really part of the major narrative, but they're really compelling to me. And here's my story or my perspective or my take on that. And I would love to, to see those emerge as well. Uh, Lauren. I'd just like to remind us that we are kind of new on stuff like TikTok. And so what would really be helpful is if we can get someone who's actually an expert who knows things like TikTok or Twitter or something like that, and then say, hey, would you like a whole posse to discuss something that you're interested in that we can like, you know, um, ideate on, and then they can kind of take that, we can work with them to create a story that they can push out that, you know, that they are experts in knowing because you need that you know, other end of an audience already there. Who, who would, who volunteers to put a note on the OGM list to check our networks for a young human who knows how to use TikTok pretty well? Maybe I should bring in my daughter here. <laughs> Romer, that'd be great. If, if somebody, if somebody like, like your daughter could give us a tutorial on how to use TikTok <laughs> well, that would be phenoms. I think that'd be one. In terms of using, <laughs> in terms of using TikTok well, uh, I watched an interview with Sarah Cooper, who's the woman who does the imitations of Donald Trump. It takes her about eight hours to do one minute of TikTok. Mm -hmm. So, and she's been using it for a while. So yeah. um, anything we can do, you know, um, Nancy Duarte in her wonderful book, Slideology says any, an hour long presentation done really well is going to take 40 hours to prepare for. So we have to recognize that while this is a wonderful idea, there's a significant amount of work to make that happen. And then I wanted to go back to something Scott said at the beginning where, um, you know, so many people are working at a very low level of education. So it's got to, the, the things that we do need to invite them in in a way that do not seem that we're talking down to them, but make them feel like they can be included in the conversation. And so that's going to be another challenge for those of us who are a little more intellectual to find out how do we 
put it in simple language, not dumb it down, but put it in appropriate, inviting language that's going to work for them. One of the things that was a superpower of Russ Acoff's that irritated all of his peers in systems thinking was that he could take really sophisticated ideas and put them in, in 10th grade language, maybe not fourth grade language, but 10th grade language. So, and his books were extremely understandable. His, and so he appealed tremendously to corporate executives. He was, you know, he was in at, uh, at Bush, at Mars, at so Anheuser-Busch, Mars, Martin Marietta, a whole bunch of big companies loved him because he could express himself very, very simply. And his, his peers hated him because he wasn't writing academic papers with long words and he wasn't citing everybody else's research <clears throat> you know, as he wrote academic papers. He was actually trying to be practical in the field. Scott, go ahead. So to, to Ken's point about how much time it takes to make a set of video, something I learned recently was that one of the reasons that the new podcasts that are three hours long are, are taking off is because they're, they're unedited. And so to speak to your, uh, Jerry's idea about trust and how bringing trust in, one of the nice things about it is you watch the whole conversation. There's no, well, we rearranged this, we cut out this section. And so what I'm thinking is that one of the things about TikTok or other, other medium like that is that they seem authentic just because they didn't take 40 hours to make 30 seconds. And the ones that, that do that, there's that that trust that mm, okay is this is this trying to do something that that I don't trust I mean I was watching a thing with my wife last night a guy was out camping in the woods for two hours and we watched him set up the tent and cook and and it was just it was just authentic there was something about it that it didn't feel manipulative just because it was just you know it wasn't polished so. Um, uh, and you just triggered another, th I, I think I dreamt last night that I had a podcast again, which is weird, because um, I had a podcast called the Yi Tan Weekly Call. Does anybody in this, in this room remember the Yi Tan Calls? Ken was there, Judy, yep, exactly. Um, so I did that for nine years with Pip Coburn, and then I put it to sleep about a year before podcasting got hot again. <laughs> so really good timing mm -hmm. on that. Um, also, I was terrible about fixing the back end, so it never quite clicked over to Apple, to iTunes podcasts and all of that. The back end didn't work. All of these calls are available right now in the Internet Archive for free. They're, if you just search for Yitan with a hyphen, you'll find them. But I was sort of dreaming like, oh, maybe I should, maybe I should just be podcasting my experience of our journey together in OGM and blah, blah, blah. And you just made me realize... I have a, a, a pure audio file of every one of our calls, which I have been putting on YouTube, like all of our OGM calls and this one will go up today. They're all on YouTube, but there's just no reason whatsoever why they couldn't be repurposed and put on, into a podcast, which would be really, I think, lovely. Um, does anybody think that's a good or bad idea? Yes, Maybe? and I think it needs to be a short podcast. Um, meaning somebody needs to edit it down? Because that, that's, the, that's the critical thing is if you want to edit this, that is going to take a huge amount of time. If you think that sitting through authentic conversations about fixing the world that take time but are interesting is worth it, then that's easy for us to do. <clears throat> the moment we have to edit these down, we, we then need to hire somebody or do something different or, and make judgments about what, what to snip out of the calls. The other thing we could easily do, Judy, is... Um, if we find a way to mark important moments in our calls and go back to them, Lauren, either from the auto transcript or from something else, we could easily create a separate podcast, which is just highlights of um, OGM calls, which might be really interesting. So Mark Antoine, then Lauren. The, a, I think having them is a good idea because they're there, they're useful. And it's the reality that in the long form, very few people will listen to them. And that's a reality. But again, connecting them with the transcript means that people will be able to find ex excerpts. I'm all for that. I think I want to bring back something Ken said uh, or, and something I was saying. Like, you know, I said, we need to connect the pith statements to the more complex language. And then Ken said, well, we need to invite people into conversations. And I thousand percent agree with that. I mean, people won't participate unless they have a chance to be heard. And, and that means conversations which take time, which are elaborate, where things get repeated many times over by different people, and that's what the process is. So how do we 
I mean, that's been my technical work for a while, right? How to go from this long form conversations to synthetic views. And, and, and I think that's key, right? The, we need the long form conversations because that's where change happens. It's, it takes time to change. It takes time to uh, ex, you know, get aligned. And we do need to be able to have, here's the pith statement that came out of this so that people can be exposed to that and that when people are seeing here's the publicity version of that, because there will have to be a publicity version. Here's how it connects to this. Well, these are the key findings with a more diverse view that came out of that. And further, here's all the conversation where this arose. So making those connected, I still think is a key thing. And sorry, I'm tooting my horn again, but I think those connections need to- You have a lot of horn to toot, it's very good. Um, and Judy, I'm sorry that I dampened your excellent idea early <clears throat> because, well, because I wasn't realizing what crowd I'm sitting in right now. <clears throat> and it's like, I think, I think the long form podcast could be one offer and we should just do that. And that's an easy thing for us to do. And then let's apply our tools and do everything that you said and that Marc Antoine just said and so forth. So I think that would work great. And Lauren and I have been talking and probably why she has her hand up because in the harvesting process, we were proposing to collect these snippets from all of the snarky calls and use those you say more, Lauren, you're better at this than me. Yeah, go ahead, Lauren. Yeah, so we've been, um, at Kiko Lab, we've been um, doing a lot on harvesting. So I've kind of developed a, a, in a, an approach, a kind of a um, way of doing quickest kind of wrap of uh, a session where it's a lot less editing time, where we upload it to Otter, get the transcript, Anyone can go in there and highlight it. And then it timestamps it, which allows me, and if we had software, we could do it all together. I use, um, I use Adobe software because I'm a graphic designer. Um, but if we had, you know, some, some group software, we could even do it as a group where um, it, once it's highlighted, I can just take it out by the timestamp and make the cuts and do it pretty much quicker than um, normally. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, Ken, the, that's the thing. Sorry, Lauren. Um, Ken, then me. Uh, just want to throw in, um, over the years, I've developed what I call authentic crowdsourcing. You know, crowdsourcing is putting up a question on the internet and people just out whatever their ideas are which is great to generate ideas but it doesn't get you drilled down into what's underneath so uh in working with a couple of corporations um i have developed a world cafe process where i've got people at tables of four and a proposal is put forth by the vp and i ask people three questions and i have envelopes on the table for them to do the harvesting so the first question is what's exciting to you about this what why do you like this idea and they talk for 20 minutes or 30 minutes, and then I have them pull out the envelope and take out the cards and write down the you know one sentence pithy thing of here's what I really love about this. Then the, they go to a new table, and the second round is um, what is um, uh, uh, unclear to you about this? What what are the problems you see with this? And again, they have that conversation, and they're with their peers, so they really understand what's going on. And again, they do the harvesting of that. And then the third round. Um, new table, new people, and they talk. And the question is, what question or questions do you have that need to be addressed before you can move forward with this idea? So that we're now getting down to, I get this, um, I'm excited about this, I'm concerned about this, in order for me to move forward, I need to know this and write that down. And I've done that a few times now, and it's an amazing process where in three hours, uh, I generated one Excel spreadsheet with um, 250 people in the room there were uh, like 1,500 questions at the end. And um, so the, this guy thought he had this really simple idea, right? He got 1,500 questions of this range, no. And they were, you know, a lot of them were overlapping, but it is a really fantastic way to bring people together in conversation. Uh, those three things seem to be really working well together. What, am I, what do I like about this? What am I unsure about? And what do I need to know to work with it? I think we could do something, OGM could do something in terms of holding, um, combination of World Cafe open space calls uh, with people who'd like to come in around specific ideas 
using that format could be really juicy and give us a way to, to find out what people are most interested in and, and how we can move forward with some of our, uh, what we've been talking about here today. Also, um, have you described this process and posted it any place online? Would you be interested in doing that? Because I think part of what we can also be is curators of really great group process techniques uh, and publish them so that other people can pick them up and reuse them. Uh, at which point we also cross this line into intellectual property and how people feel about that and their own ideas and all of that. So I'm, I'm very aware that some people's process methods are, are, are things they hold near and dear to their hearts. Uh, but my, my hope is that we can actually put a lot of high functioning uh, group process in the world and then, and then be guides to people finding really great group process. And that, and that can people like you become custodians, guides, concierges of a variety of group process techniques and where, where you are expert in a few that you love, you are knowledgeable in many more that you've heard of that you like, that you recommend, and where you're kind of a guide to others and other people who are guides to the rest of it, you know, like, like Nancy White. And you know, we, we know a zillion fabulous facilitators. How do, we, how do we enable much more of that to show up in companies? Um, which takes me down a whole different piece, uh, which may, be, may go back to the idea of guilds here in, in OGM. But I think that improving meetings and improving corporate decision-making is a huge opening for us. And knowledge management has beat its head you know, against the wall for, for 35 years. And, and has made only a little bit of inroads. But, but if we can help organizations lather or rinse repeat on what you're describing and, and do a much better job of it and have a corporate memory, then we're really kind of getting someplace interesting. No, I've not read it up. Yes, I'd be willing to do that. Uh, I'm not trying to hold anything close to the vest here. I think we need to get stuff out in the world that works. And so my only request would be if people use it to just let me know and credit me with it. You know, this idea came from Ken, like a kind of a liberating structure sort of thing. You know, uh, I want it to be out there in the world. I'm not trying to, um, you know, if you want to send me a little money, fine, but I'm not expecting that. So. Um, and building in a way to reward the creator of an idea while keeping the idea free is something I love and believe in very strongly. Do you have a Patreon page, Ken? I do not. Uh, that might be a good, thing to, a, a good thing to start. And then Marc-Antoine, this takes us back to the conversation of how broad should the semantic media wiki be uh, that we would like to, to cultivate a pattern language in, but I can easily envision describing this methodology on said wiki, which apparently you like. Cool. Um, and we're, we're going like into the 90 minute territory, we should uh, start wrapping up. Any, uh, and I'm just catching up on the chat, any sort of uh, summarizing words toward where this takes us? Well, we I think we've decided we need to have some synthesis. Go ahead, Max, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't have my mic positioned right. Uh, do we have representatives from each of the five breakout groups? I don't think this we group? have. You mean in this group? I don't think we're all yeah. represented here. So one, and hold two. up your uh, one, two, five. Uh, I don't four. see any fours or threes. Oh, sorry, I'm four. Oh, there's four. Uh, Max is four. Okay. four. So we don't have anybody from three. Okay. Cool. We're close. I mean, I think if it's, I think it'd be it'd be useful to have a a, a rep from from team three. Um, and you know, pick a time. I don't know. We didn't spend much time entirely diving into what the exact process will be for synthesis. So we kind of need to um, design it before meeting again or design it once meeting again um, and feel our way through it. Well, what in the meantime, we have- three. Excuse me? Matt's from team three. Was he Matt. gonna participate? Matt. Mm. Oh, okay, yeah, Matt was on this call. Would it make sense to do some pre-work in, in, on email? I was, I was just going to ask, would somebody in, on this call like to write a note to the whole OGM list saying what we'd like to do with this process and asking anybody from group three to jump in uh, and saying anybody who feels like they'd like to you know, uh, add energy to the synthesis process, please like raise your hand, contact me or, or us or whatever. Uh, would one of you like to do that? I'm happy to help edit it or whatever, but it'd be really great to, to get that in the room. Describe a process, propose um, a process. Yeah, so basically an invite to the OGM list to join a synthesis team 
uh, to look at what we did in the workshop and, uh, and also a specific invite to anybody on team three uh, mm -hmm. to be represented yeah. at, you know, on, on the group, but, but basically mm -hmm. to, to, to try to move toward outputs uh, yeah. of the kind we've been talking about on this call. Mm -hmm. And propose after. a time for a meeting? Uh, or... We can do that after. Let, let's, first, let's first assemble a squad and then we can pick a time for a call with a doodle to the team or whatever. Right, go ahead, Mark Antoine. I think that's absolutely agree, but it should come after each team had a chance to do its own and finish its own synthesis work. So just make make sure that this is part of the email, maybe that to say phase one, let's finish synthesis work in teams and phase two, let's have a synthesis team. But I agree, we, everybody should be invited. That sounds I, great. I, want, I want to do my own invitation. I'm thinking this notion of connecting pit statements to conversations to everything. For me, that's extremely important. And I think I'd like to have a conversation with others about how could that look like? But that's a separate thing. Cool. Um, Scott, go ahead. Very brief comment. Um, over the course of my time with this group and the expanded group, it has felt like we've, we've been going like this. And this is a massive problem to say, what do we do? Who are we? And yet, it now feels like every single time we get together, we're going like this. And so that's my, my, my. As long as we don't go like this. Yeah. And you've all seen the Trump accordion videos. Yes. Ah, I love the Trump accordion <laughs> videos. They're so good. <laughs> okay. So, um, Let's wrap this call. I just want to say that today might be the day that at least the media say that Biden is the next president of the United States. I am crossing my fingers and hoping that happens. I'm not going to count any chickens before they hatch. Um, I, I also want to sort of do a, a build back better OGM call uh, that basically says, okay, so that happened and it happened in a weird way. What can we do? How do we participate? What, what, was, what does this moment open up for OGM? So I'll, I'll do that in a week or two. Um, but thank you for, thank you for distilling together. I, this is, this was a really useful call. Go ahead, Ken. I'm, uh, I just went over to the Washington post. I'm looking at, um, 1205 PM Biden's lead doubles in Nevada as new posts are new, uh, votes are reported. So it's, it's looking good. Uh, FAA has prepared restrictions over the area around Biden's home. Uh, Pelosi's calling Biden president elect. Um, so, you know, fingers are crossed, but it's, it's definitely looking. Uh, Fox News called it, I, I'm waiting for Fox news to be the first major media outlet to call the election for Biden, which could happen because they were aggressive in calling Arizona. So they're, they're the only ones of the major media, I guess, Wash WAPO has now joined them, but, but they were early. So I'm, I'm crossing my fingers that, that the group that says Biden is the next president is in fact Fox News, which is like this crazy irony. Well, Biden's got 253 to Trump's 214, according to WAPO. I know different media outlets have different things, and he's ahead in Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania is worth 20, so that puts him over right there. Exactly. Um, Georgia, he's got 29 in Georgia, and he's way, uh, oh, sorry, Georgia is 16. Um, Georgia's really he's close. Very close. Um, yeah. Arizona, he's ahead by two. And Nevada, he's up by uh, 0.7. So it's a nail biter. <laughs> exactly. Um, all right, everybody. Uh, thank you very much. It's been awesome. I'll post this video and uh, we'll send some, some notes to the list. Good to see you all. Bye for now. Yeah. Bye. Bye.